Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Emily Sue. And I'm Raymond Yang. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. CY Leung appoints Taiwan-born Nicholas Yang as his technology advisor. Officers defend use of pepper spray 21 times to quell violent Yunlong protest. Police release pro-democracy figures after questioning in connection with Occupy protests. Former Polytechnic University Chief Nicholas Young has been appointed as the government's innovation and technology consultant. He had been tipped to head an innovation and technology bureau, but the government failed to receive funds to launch the new unit because of filibustering in Leshko. After his bid to set up an innovation and technology bureau was stalled again last month, Chief Executive Leung Chen Ying unveiled his Plan B today. He appointed former Polytechnic University Vice President Nicholas Young as his personal innovation and technology advisor. The 59-year-old Taiwan-born engineer had been rumored to head the bureau as early as 2012. Young, who was also appointed as a non-official member of the Executive Council, insisted there were no hard feelings having to settle for an unpaid consultancy post. I think the most important question is, it's not I'm disappointed. And I think uh, it is important to, to know that in today's uh, global economy, uh, innovation and technology really is probably the best value accelerator and at the same time, solution for a lot of the social issues that we face. The chief executive took aim at pan-democratic lawmakers who sought a $35 million funding application for his proposed bureau. The importance of innovation and technology is well understood uh, by everyone in the community, perhaps with the exception of a handful of uh, opposition members of the Legislative Council who resorted to filibustering to frustrate government's efforts uh, in this uh, direction. He claimed competitors in the region are quietly laughing at the SAR for falling behind on IT development. To further boost IT policies, Yang will also head the revamped Innovation and Technology Advisory Committee, although other group members have not been named. Police have defended their use of force in Yunlong yesterday when violence erupted during a protest against mainlanders. Officers arrested 38 people and seized knives, screwdrivers and chili oil. ATV's An Chang reports. Police today defended their decision to use force after violence erupted in Yunlong yesterday between residents and members of radical groups, protesting against the influx of mainland parallel traders and visitors. A number of people, including 10 officers, were injured in the clashes. Police gave repeated advice and warnings, including displaying warning banners to appeal to the participants to express their views in a peaceful and rational manner but they refused to comply and charged the police cordon lines. Carew said pepper spray was fired 21 times while an officer used his baton to strike and subdue a protester. A total of 38 people aged between 13 and 74 were arrested for possession of offensive weapons, assaulting or obstructing officers, disorderly conduct and assault. Two women were among the arrested while the 13-year-old was detained for attacking an officer. During the chaos, police confiscated pen knives, screwdrivers, shields, flammable liquids and chili oil. When questioned why chili oil was considered an offensive weapon, officers said that depended on the motive behind its use. During the scuffles, ATV reporter Terry Kong and a cameraman were pepper sprayed without warning. When asked if it was an accident or if the force planned to apologize, police said they must examine videos filmed by officers before making a decision. Ann Chang, ATV News. Commerce Chief Greg So condemned the violent clashes, saying it caused disruption in Yunlong. And a district councillor pressed for a review of the multiple entry visa scheme in order to stamp out parallel trading. Simmering resentment against mainland parallel traders and visitors boiled over into violence on the narrow streets of Yunlong yesterday, leaving several people bruised and bloody. Police used pepper spray to break up clashes between protesters and Yunlong residents who benefit from mainland visitors. Speaking on the radio this morning, Yunlong District Council Vice Chairman Leung Fuk Yun urged the government to face up to the problem of rampant parallel trading. He said it's time to review the multiple entry visa scheme, which is specifically for Shenzhen residents. They should monitor the numbers more closely and assess the city's receiving capacity, Leung said. 
Leung Kam Singh, convener of the North District Parallel Imports Concern Group, went further, demanding that the scheme be ditched altogether. He wants the government to set up a daily quota for visitors from Shenzhen. Commerce Chief Greg So condemned the violence, saying it affected the livelihood of Yunlong residents. He reminded people that Chief Executive Leung Chenying will raise the issue with Beijing leaders this month. So admitted the government has not yet decided whether to cap the number of trips by multiple visit visa holders. But he pointed out parallel trading and the mainland tourist influx are separate issues and should be tackled differently. Police questioned prominent democracy figures today for taking part in last year's Occupy protests, but all were released without charge. Those who reported to police dubbed the so-called arrests by appointment a publicity stunt that will further polarize society. Accompanied by their supporters, Democratic Party lawmakers Helena Wong, Albert Ho, and the Civic Party's Alan Leung and Audrey Yu showed up outside police headquarters in Wan Chai this morning. They were the latest batch of democracy figures to face arrest in connection with last year's Occupy protests. In a show of defiance, they held up yellow umbrellas and chanted slogans as they entered the building for questioning. After two hours, Ho and Wong were released without charge or bail. They were given letters notifying them of possible arrests in the future and a video copy of their interview. Ho said he was shown videos and newspaper clippings, which police believe prove his participation in unauthorized or illegal assemblies. Wong said officers showed her photos from her Facebook page for three protests she took part in September and October. Like Ho, she adopted a non-cooperative attitude and slammed the interviews as a publicity stunt to suppress the democracy movement. Democratic Party founder Martin Lee also left after an arranged interview, but did not answer questions from reporters. Another pro-democracy lawmaker, Charles Mock from the information technology sector, reported to police in the afternoon. Speaking to the media in Lechko following his unconditional release, Mock criticized the arrests as a waste of time and will do no good in forging a consensus on political reform. MPC delegate Maria Tam has warned that Hong Kong may lose its economic value to China if it fails to implement universal suffrage in 2017. Her remarks came as more pro-establishment parties submitted their political reform proposals to the government. With less than a week to go before the government wraps up its second round of public consultation on constitutional reform, political parties have been rushing to submit their views and proposals. Chief Secretary Carrie Lam confirmed this evening that she received suggestions from three pro-establishment groups today. She also noted that legal scholar Albert Chan's plank vote proposal received a lukewarm response from different sectors. Chan has suggested that if over half of the ballots in the 2017 chief executive election are not marked, the poll should be declared void, as it means most voters oppose all the candidates selected by the nominating committee. Chan's proposal was considered by some as a potential bait to convince moderate opposition members to pocket the government's reform package. Regina Ip and Michael Tian from the New People's Party said the blank vote suggestion undermines the nominating committee's authority. They proposed reserving 30 seats for women in a 1,200-strong body, but admitted it would be hard to add an extra sector for youth members. The DAB, meanwhile, said that if universal suffrage is introduced in 2017, the candidate with the most votes should be declared the winner. The pro-Beijing party had previously suggested a second ballot if no candidate secures more than 50 percent of the votes. But the party says a runoff would be cumbersome because the city has 5 million registered voters. The Business and Professionals Alliance also submitted its blueprint, saying anyone with the support of 100 members of the nominating committee can enter the race. The pan-democrats are snubbing the consultation process and have vowed to veto the government's political reform package so long as it's set under Beijing's tight conditions. They say the framework rules out any chances of genuine universal suffrage. Speaking in Beijing, National People's Congress delegate Maria Tan warned Hong Kong's economic value to China may diminish if LegCo rejects the reform package. I think um, if we are not able to ourselves improve the way we manage our legislative and executive relationships, such as having a universal suffrage for 2017, uh, we are going to do ourselves great injury in the sense that uh, we spend so much time on political arguments, uh, we will have no, uh, no energy left 
to do our economic development. Tam added it's pointless to restart the political reform process after 2017, as China's leadership will remain unchanged for another eight years. China's annual parliamentary session kicks off in Beijing tomorrow with a report from its top political advisory body. A CPPCC spokesman said that 2,200 delegates will listen to more than 300 speeches during the 10-day forum. The National People's Congress opens its session on Thursday, with Premier Li Keqiang delivering his work report, which includes China's policy blueprint for this year. The key document is expected to clarify Beijing's stance on political reform in Hong Kong in the wake of last year's pro-democracy protests. The recent spat between Beijing and London over the pace of democracy in Hong Kong was forgotten as President Xi Jinping welcomed Prince William to the Great Hall of the People. The second in line to the British throne handed Xi an invitation from his grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, to visit London. She said he was looking forward to touring Britain later this year. William is the first British royal to travel to China in nearly 30 years. One of the first places he visited in Beijing was the Forbidden City, which was the imperial palace of the Ming and Qing dynasties. Tensions between North and South Korea have risen after Pyongyang fired two short-range missiles. The missiles were launched in a show of anger and defiance as South Korea and the U.S. began military drills. ATV's Joyce Ru reports. Just hours before the annual U.S.-South Korea joint military exercises began, North Korea fired two short-range missiles into the sea. The missiles, with a range of 490 kilometers, were launched from the western city of Nampo and landed in the sea east of the Korean peninsula. The rockets were fired just hours before South Korea and the U.S. kicked off joint military exercises involving tens of thousands of troops. The annual drills are always guaranteed to drive North Korea into a state of frenzy. It was no surprise that state TV denounced the exercises, describing them as a rehearsal for an invasion and warning that South Korea and the U.S. should be dealt with by merciless strikes. But Washington and Seoul insist that the military maneuvers lasting eight weeks are defensive. South Korea condemned its rival's missile launch, saying no warning was given to ships in the area. Seoul warned that it will retaliate if North Korea takes provocative actions. Japan lodged a strong protest with Pyongyang, saying the rockets could cause risks at sea and in the air. Joyce Wu, 